well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's wonderful to see you. And, you know, one of the points that I think is so very important, uh, can I be heard well? Is it, are you hearing me well? Is it loud enough? And um, let's see, just make right. sure. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's um, perfect. Good. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I see your faces and I just have real enthusiasm and hope because, uh, you know, people, people, people are, um, are being very brave and, uh, and also because they know that this is the right situation. And, and quite frankly, I do think that this is a, um, uh, a, a late uh, attempt to change something that's not going to go backward. It's not going to go backward. And of course, Wozici has uh, been a place, as you all know, in the 1960s because of the Cold War, the politics were different, but the repression was there. And in 1980, the military coup, the same thing. So you have gone through this for how many years? 150 years, you will keep going. So I, I'm very pleased with that. And with all the students who are here, um, and I send the greetings of my students, uh, particularly those at CUNY Graduate Center. Um, uh, people are aware of uh, the situation in uh, Turkey and uh, they are certainly on your side. So it's important that we keep visible to each other. This is one of the, the things I think is most, uh, most threatening to uh, the uh, repressive uh, politics uh, that we find in countries is that uh, people have a sense that they are not alone and that they are part of something that's uh, uh, indeed global in scope. Um, and so the first thing, I don't know how many years ago I was there for two weeks and it was a much more uh, optimistic time um, uh, at Wozici. But what, what impressed me so much is that um, unlike I think, and I would say better than, uh, the 1960s or maybe an earlier period, which was so uh, thoroughly um, um, or monolithically about a certain kind of Marxist critique of capital, we're still critical of capital, but there is a much more diverse notion of the subject, of the, of the subject of change. And women's role has been extremely important and um, minority roles have been important and, and the, the celebration of diversity um, it, it's the only way forward. Uh, and so these kinds of nationalist or exclusionary politics, it seems to me, are, are, cannot succeed. Because even if you just look at the technology, which has us all here together in this little Zoom, in these little squares, you know, uh, you can't, uh, you can't um, stop that kind of uh, spread of ideas and, and spread of uh, enthusiasm uh, with each other. So, I guess what I'm going to try to do, because I've, I've found that to give a just a, a red lecture is, is not so good on Zoom. It's better to maybe show some pictures. So if I share my screen with you, um, first I have to make sure I have it. Yes. I, I think I need to make you co-hosts. You but... do. You do. Okay, so. Uh, I opened it actually, uh, you can share the screen. Yes, I see it. I can share the screen. Okay, so uh, wait, I'm the screen back to where it should be. Hold on. Um, one moment for technology on my side. Okay. And Don't now, worry, I'm on the same side. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we go. And now I have to make this a full screen. So I'm not quite sure, um, so this is kind of called a neoliberal disorder. Uh, I'm not quite sure what order these are in, so it's maybe disorder in the presentation as well, but uh, the, the images will speak for themselves a lot. Now, first I have to uh, view uh, full screen. Wait, come on. It's not yet full screen. Oh, I see what happened. Okay, here we go. So um, 
so my comments will be about the neoliberal global disorder. I mean, the, the global situation, if you're not thinking globally, you, you, you can't grasp what's going on. And uh, here we have this uh, reality of uh, global disorder that is uh, uh, confronting a nationalist political uh, ideology, which is a, a necessary one, but it's always bad faith because the powers of uh, national um, populism or even worse uh, words you could use, but let's just call it nationalist populism, okay, that this kind of nationalism, this new nationalism uh, goes hand in hand with oligarchies who control the wealth of the country and who themselves live in a very global space and their money uh, travels very uh, freely uh, and their uh, interests uh, are aligned with uh, oligarchs in other countries. So um, there's nothing nationalist about the, these kinds of ruling elites um, in, in their actual lives, uh, which makes the, uh, the glorification of the nation uh, purely uh, self-interested. But we, so we have this kind of national politics that's confronting global capital, global ecological problems, the global pandemic, and all of our problems are global problems. They can't be isolated within national borders. So this is such an artificial construction of the nation state as the place that you defend. Uh, and and it's, it's quite obvious to people, particularly the young generation that understands how connected people are. Um, so on the one hand, national populations are losing control, not only capital, but over the social commitments of their governments as well. And under these conditions, politicians appeal to nationalism in an attempt to deflect the real structural inequalities by fostering an exclusionist or racist or anti-immigrant response within domestic politics, undermining the powerful global solidarity that resistance movements in the past decades have in fact achieved. Now, this is my optimism. A lot of my leftist friends are, are not as uh, optimistic as I am, uh, but I, I do believe that the uh, the resistance movements do add up to something quite significant. It may still take a decade or whatever until this actually produces a, a, a transformation of the global uh, disorder. But uh, it, it is um, uh, the, the forces that are pushing in favor of that transformation are, are, uh, are coming together. The ecological concerns, the uh, uh, concerns of the structural inequalities and the structural equalities uh, in global capitalism, I, I could show any kind of uh, set of graphs and I can't really read graphs very well, but I know that it's not good to have those lines go up because this is Piketty who writes about income distribution and how the disparity or the income inequality in the United States is reflected also in um, emerging countries. Uh, so we don't have a situation where there's a real difference between one part of the world and the other. And I think that's a different situation perhaps than the older imperialist um, uh, concerns. Now, here's something I wanna just throw out about the um, global economy. This is a wonderful chart of the uh, Soviet economy when pr prior to any kind of uh, computer capacity, you tried to take a country as large as Russia or as large as the Soviet republics together and produce one plan for, the, for a centralized economy. It was absolutely impossible to achieve, but we have now a new uh, technology and there hasn't been any attempt at socialism uh, that, that works with the transformation of the technologies uh, that go along with the computer and with algorithms, et cetera which can indeed um, produce a, a less centralized method of uh, socialist economy. And the example I give is one that was proposed and begun uh, in Chile under Allende, um, who, as you know, was uh, killed a, a, and overthrown in 1973. But here in, in a very early stage, the idea was to use computers so this would be your bureaucracy. It would be a bunch of people sitting around uh, in the government level who would coordinate um, the plan for the nation on the economic level 
and then send back the information to the factories, to the localities, and they themselves would initiate the change. So I'm just saying that the new uh, possibilities of uh, contemporary technology don't only work for um, making global uh, uh, co um, companies more and more monopolistic, they could also turn around uh, and uh, produce a, a, a different kind of socialism than that which we had in the 20th century. Um, it's clear globally that crisis is systemic for capitalism. Here's the first wave in uh, particularly hit hard in Southeast Asia, uh, a financial crisis. And here we have Argentina and the United States. So there's no place that's immune from a capitalist crisis. Uh, inequality is, is then a global dynamic. And what's interesting is that democracy, the democratization of the global elites is really quite significant. Uh, China, of course, as our communist example, has uh, over 500 uh, billion, um, pardon me, 500 billionaires. Um, and uh, Turkey we see has, it's a medium red or even a dark, a medium red, I would call it, has somewhere between 11 and 50 billionaires. These are billionaires, not millionaires. So in other words, the wealthy elite uh, is quite global, quite multiracial, uh, and, and actually quite um, um, you know, uh, tolerant of a, of a post-national uh, uh, orientation. So, but the rest of us wake up on the wrong side of capitalism. And uh, the rest of us could be as high as 99%. I do think that this phrase, we are the 99% was rather brilliant because it indicated that there are even people who are professionals are not winning in the system of global capital. It really is a, a fundamentally unfair uh, uh, political or economic order. And it's been my argument for quite some time now that the real mistake has been to equate modernity with modernization with industrialization and equate that in turn with progress. Uh, so, you know, this is Russia trying to catch up to the United States by making polluting factories. Um, and yet there were, there were possibilities of, a, of an ecological technological development. Even then they, they, they were talking about solar energy and those kinds of things. But ultimately, the idea was there's only one stage, one path toward development, and every country had to take it, or else you were backward. Right? Um, and so if the hydroelectric power was the right kind of power, then Russia should have it too. Uh, this is, however, a solar experiment that was proposed as early as 1929 in Russia. This is this wonderful uh, city of Brasilia. It's really quite beautiful, which is a kind of utopia of modernization and as modernity um, in, in the state of Brazil. Uh, but uh, if that was uh, the, um, it was built, I think in the 1970s, what we have by 2016 at the Olympics is uh, Rio de Janeiro's uh, water so polluted that uh, it was considered unsafe to swim, but Brazil is not alone here. Uh, you can look any place in the world for uh, documentation of pollution. And I think this universality of, uh, of a, a, um, a crisis for humanity uh, is extremely powerful politically, uh, particularly for your generation. But then the question is, how do we think about revolution? Um, in a way that is different from the uh, methods of the past. And I think that uh, this is the famous uh, 11th thesis on Feuerbach that philosophers have only uh, interpreted the world in different ways, but the point is to change it. So it's a practice. I mean, theory should to me, not just be a, a, a condition, uh, an analysis of the bad state of things, but it should be a kind of theory that implies a practice. Um, and here is the famous phrase, what 
to do in various languages. Um, and here are some lessons I think of the 20th century. One is that Marxist revolutions have not happened in advanced economies. They have not been successful in advanced economies. Rather, it's Russia, China, or Cuba that have had the most successful revolutions. And this means there is no blueprint of history, no stages of development. No one is ahead. No one is behind. There is no waiting room of history. There is also no metaphysics of history, no inevitability of revolution and therefore no party dictatorship is justified. And the point is, I think that experiments in political culture uh, need to replace party vanguardism because no one has the right answers. It's not as if we know exactly where we're going and therefore uh, we entrust to the party of Lenin or Stalin or Erdogan uh, to take us there, right? So experimentation uh, should be the uh, methodology of political transformation. And also, I mean, this, uh, this line from Benjamin, which is actually in his notes uh, to the uh, theses on the philosophy of history. Uh, they're not uh, in the, the document on the concept of history, but they're very famous by now. Uh, Benjamin writes, Marx said the revolutions were the locomotives of history. Perhaps it is otherwise Perhaps it is the reaching of humanity riding in that train for the emergency break. Um, and this idea that revolution is to stop a certain trajectory of development, this is really, really brand new and very important. Uh, and because it's not a question of you know, conserving the past at all. It's just understanding that this notion of modernity and progress is, is lethal. It, 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 it will uh, cause uh, the end of life on this planet. So uh, this, this became a very commonly shared motif among uh, uh, social movements uh, in the 21st century. Um, uh, so if history is the myth of modernity that matriarchy is supposedly superseded by patriarchy or primitive societies by more developed ones or Western society is historically advanced um, or modernity supersedes traditional societies. All of that has to be given up. Um, and that means there's no romanticization of the past, but there's an understanding that uh, uh, that linear notion of time is simply wrong, it's inaccurate. So I'm just showing here how this phrase of Benjamin kept being repeated and repeated and repeated. So the next thing I wanna to touch on very briefly is who the agent of revolutionary change is. Uh, uh, it was Lukács who said that the working class was the subject object of history. This is his very Hegelian formulation. Um, but that's not the case. The working class is not the subject object of history that will transcend all uh, contradictions in the social order. Uh, but that means that there are no primary and secondary contradictions. And I don't know if that's a, a common phrase for you all, but it was when I was uh, younger, uh, all of the Marxists would say things like, oh, feminism, that's a secondary contradiction, uh, contradiction or racism, that's a secondary contradiction. The big primary contradiction is class. If you solve that, then everything else will be solved. And of course, that's not true. So the revolutionary collective is not the universalization of an abstraction like the working class. There's Istanbul below there. Just gonna show some of these images without much comment. Just from all the different places they come, these are all 21st century movements. And this is my favorite. The revolution will be feminist or it will not be. 
so in short, the collective is plural. And that, that uh, affirmation of plurality as opposed to uh, a conflict between collective identities. It's, I, I think that identity politics is not uh, uh, capable of the, uh, of the kind of solidarity that uh, any uh, collective that is desirous of change uh, can achieve. So the collective is plural. And this is my favorite. <laughs> it's, I don't know if it's still on the streets of uh, Istanbul, uh, is it? Or has it washed off with the rain? I don't know, but it's really beautiful. And that kind of street, street art, to me, that's, it, I mean, it's so hopeful, it's so beautiful, it's so affirmative. Um, so, uh, yes, it's it there. It's still there? It's really, really, really nice. And it's, it's uh, you know, I show this uh, image around the world and everybody knows that this is Turkey. And, and Gezi was that, more so than many of the movements. Gezi was this, this plurality of different um, groups who were not the same, but who had a kind of solidarity with each other. And it was really the most uh, beautiful thing about uh, that uh, movement. And, you know, it, the spirit of this, um, you know, stays alive uh, and spreads to other places. So uh, the idea is that the, the solidarities are translocal and they produce a signifying chain across nations and what oh, I made a I made a line. I didn't mean to. <laughs> oh, how do I get rid of that line? Annotate. Uh, Hmm, I, I made a line and I didn't mean to, oops, I'm making other lines, I, I better. Uh, someone is uh, with the line. Yeah. So I'm trying to erase it, but I cannot do. I think it's okay. Oh, yay, oh, it left, <laughs> left, good, okay. Uh, so this was, these are examples of um, um, movements. Wait a minute, okay. Why is that not happening? Somehow it's stuck. Hmm, let me escape from here for a moment. Uh-oh. My screen froze. Ah! And I drew another line. Uh, it can be because of that, if the anonite part is open, then you need to close it. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment right. and then go back uh, and share again, hopefully. Let's see. Are you, are you seeing it? Uh, I, sometimes this computer has been, okay, I'm, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to share the screen and we'll see what happens. Uh, here, share. And now, go to you. I better do it from down here, otherwise I'm gonna have trouble. There we go. Okay, so the idea is here, when there wasn't enough of this in the early, you know, in, in, 20, uh, in 2011, 12, 13, but here is one example um, of Dublin and Istanbul, or um, in another one, um, Greeks, but it tended, for instance, in New York, it would be the, the immigrant Greeks who would be, have solidarity with Greeks at home. But we have to have a way of really feeling that straight, that same solidarity with who, whoever is on the street, right? And not just the people whom we re recognize. And the, this is uh, Ferguson and the, uh, um, the Palestinians were very early to support the uh, Black Lives Matter movement in the United States. Um, and I have a quotation here from Angela Davis. I don't know how the movement for black lives would have unfolded had it not been for the fact that Palestinian activists immediately offered solidarity and were at the forefront of an international solidarity movement that further emboldened people in this country to stand up and fight police violence. This is so important. And you know, um, 
sometimes it feels like you're not doing anything when you when you send a letter or well, you even sign a petition, but there is this kind of um, necessity of understanding. And I just don't know why this is, there we go. Uh, this is uh, in South uh, Africa, I believe. And my, this is my point, we must remain visible to each other and, and we must use Zoom, Zoom to keep, keep talking together. It's very important. Um, and uh, you know, in, in, Ch in China, this uh, movement of Tiananmen Square from 1989 was totally oppressed and uh, the new movements in Hong Kong are having the same um, fate. Um, so if we wanna create a planetary politics, then numbers matter. And this, I mean, these numbers are amazing, but also I wanna point out the, that this kind of uh, archive of uh, street protest was produced uh, by the demonstrators themselves. And uh, in, in many cases with very uh, low tech uh, cell phones or whatever, there's Madrid, this is Argentina, this is Istanbul, your wonderful place again. Rio and Brazil. Ukraine. This is International Women's Day uh, after Trump was inaugurated. And uh, this, uh, this whole idea of a kind of translocal solidarity of demonstrations, it began in 2003 with a global protest against the US invading uh, Iraq. It didn't stop the war. Um, but there were, protests were held in 600 cities uh, and it has continued since the war took place. Uh, according to BBC News, six to 11 million people took part in that 2003 protest, February 15th and up to 60 countries over that weekend. Uh, so in other words, this was the, the invention. Uh, there was a website put up and everybody took pictures and then uploaded the images. So that there is this archive from 2013, which was the first time that a, a, a street level uh, initiative that didn't have any central organization on the top, no NGO, no UN organization, nothing like that, actually brought people out on the street and gave them the sense that they did produce a planetary movement. Um, so this, this, this cell phone technology is not nothing in my estimation. Uh, here, are, here are pictures of the, uh, of the 2003 demonstrations, every place from Athens to Bombay to Antarctica uh, and Berlin. Uh, and these are just a whole mess of those, those images. So, I mean, uh, my protest is against, um, uh, you know, class will not will not do it. There is a class war, but as Warren Buffett says, uh, the rich are making that war and the rich are winning. Uh, I I think that there should be no fetishization of revolutionary violence, um, and this is maybe controversial. But the fact that women can kill as well as men uh, in I don't consider it terrific. Um, you know, that's not what I think a true liberation is. Although I know that, you know, there shouldn't be sexism in the army. The army is not, um, is not to me uh, the instrument of any kind of revolutionary politics. But at the same time, there should be no fetishization of the law. Um, and this is the famous statement by Reverend Martin Luther King in 1963 never forget that everything Hitler did in Germany was illegal, P pardon me, was legal. In other words, you can legally produce a dictatorship. <laughs> I mean, we're facing it in multiple countries um, as we know. Um, but uh, it was uh, this Nobel Peace Prize winner and Holocaust survivor who first said, you know, you who are so-called illegal aliens must know that no human being is illegal. That's a contradiction in terms. Human beings can be beautiful or more beautiful. They can be fat or skinny. They can be right or wrong, but illegal. How can a human being 
be illegal. And this phrase uh, was then picked up by this uh, Muslim immigration lawyer uh, in the United States who was helping uh, uh, immigrants who were being treated uh, as illegal aliens at the border, the southern border. Uh, and then it caught on. So when there was a Muslim ban at JFK airport in New York City, people immediately went out to the airport and held up signs, no human is illegal. And this then kept being repeated, no one is illegal, no person is illegal. Uh, kein Mensch ist illegal, uh, all, all over the world. So the way to prevent an end of democracy is to make democracy the means. Again, uh, and I know this is controversial too, you know, that some people, I don't consider this an anarchist position, although perhaps it is, to say that it's got to be grassroots. It's got to be uh, a movement that's democratic from the start. It can't uh, uh, be a tightly organized hierarchical movement of a party that holds the interests the universal interest in its minority hands. Uh, and, you know, uh, this, this, these are just more recent pictures of people who, you know, maybe in Europe and maybe in uh, Turkey, it's not going on right now, but here's Sudan in 2017. Here's 2019. Um, and it finally was successful in putting down uh, the government. So here's a celebration in, uh, of the train to Khartoum on August 2019. So this is Sudan. Um, and the government was toppled. Uh, there's agreement now for a transitional government, but one doesn't know. Is it going to be al-Sisi? In other words, is it going to be like the uh, Egyptian revolution or, or a Gezi Park, which ended up uh, you know, not being able to sustain the kinds of progressive politics that began. This is Hong Kong. And I just heard on the news today that uh, the leaders of the Hong Kong fight um, are being arrested and being prevented from running for office. That, that's the idea. Um, and here, Moscow. And here, uh, Eastern Russia. These are 2018, 2019. And this, uh, uh, when Putin has proposed a draft of constitutional amendments that would allow him to stay in power uh, indefinitely, uh, there is uh, more, uh, uh, change power, not the revolution, uh, pardon me, not the constitution. Uh, and, and this, it's been very, very strong, uh, the grassroots street movements going on right now in Russia. And Black Lives Matter was also an enormously successful um, um, cross-racial coalition. And here at Nigeria is taking the knee for uh, in, in solidarity with uh, uh, against the uh, murder of George Floyd. So these kinds of things keep happening. They keep happening. Um, and, and so Black Lives Matter protests are being held in Germany, France, uh, et cetera. Um, and now this is a recent, uh, these are kind of just a bunch of uh, images. They don't have any specific order, but this is neoliberalism was born in Chile and will die in Chile. Chile has been very active, particularly the student movement in Chile has been extremely active uh, in bringing about change and refusing to be quiet. Um, this is again, Chile. Uh, uh, in February, 2021, Thailand, 2020. Now the dangers of reaction are real and we're seeing them all over. Um, this was the Rabah massacre was when uh, El Sisi um, 
was responsible for the death of approximately a thousand people on the streets. So one cannot be, and this is uh, what began as a kind of a continuation of the 2011 Arab Spring in Damascus ended up in a horrible civil war that is still going on today. This is Damascus 2011. And here is Aleppo, for instance, 2016 after destruction. Uh, and this is from a, a filmmaker's uh, uh, stills uh, for uh, showing the what, what is happening on the ground in Syria. So we cannot be that celebratory when the reaction is so violent. Um, and uh, there should be no um, false um, understanding of the power of reaction. Here's Belarus, 2020. I mean, my point is simply in every continent in the world, these uh, mass demonstrations keep happening. And there is a sense when you see them that you're on their side and you don't know the exact situation. We, we remain opaque to, you know, to each other, this opacity that Glissant talks about. We don't, we, we don't, we can't put ourselves really in another person's shoes, but we understand that there is something that unites us when we choose to perform this kind of protest on the streets and to take back the streets uh, but also the many, many times, uh, oh, so the point here is simply that nothing is obvious. Solidarity is not just about putting yourself in someone else's shoes. You, you, you can't know, but you, you've got to have solidarity despite the fact that you don't speak the language, that you don't know the details, but there has to be some awareness that uh, your, um, your, your vision of the future is beginning to be shared. And I'm, go I'm not gonna talk all about, I'm gonna maybe end up with the politics of aesthetic form because I'm sure I've spoken enough already and that's too much, too much, too much. That's a film, uh, I'm not gonna talk about that. Well, maybe just to say that this is Milo Rao. I don't know if you know this German filmmaker who made um, a, a, a movie that showed at the Venice Biennale, except that Biennale didn't really happen because of COVID in uh, fall of 2020. And uh, this is a still from the movie and he had uh, the immigrants from Africa, uh, most of them Muslims, who were uh, caught in um, uh, a refugee camp in uh, Southern Italy and made to work in the fields, but didn't have any papers and they couldn't better their lives. And so they played Christ and uh, they enacted the, the Last Supper uh, and the gospel uh, uh, in a very different way. Oh, I'm not gonna go, I don't, that's a lot of time to do all that. Um, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do any of that. It's interesting, but it's a kind of another topic and um, it would take us maybe too far afield. So what I want to end up um, kind of saying here is that uh, the solidarity that we have to have for each other cannot be um, innocent. I mean, it cannot be what do I want to say? It can't be uh, naive, uh, but it has to be persistent because there is something that is happening and, and the numbers who are um, potentially on a, a shared side of progress are really amazingly large. And the thing that has to be remembered is that the nationalist reaction is bad faith because that nationalist reaction is supported uh, by moneyed interests who, whose uh, attitude toward their own oligarchy is totally global. They're perfectly fine with global resorts and you know, global travel and global um, finance capital. 
they, but they want to keep some sort of national uh, sense, uh, which will, will keep us blind to the uh, global uh, situations that we share. So it, it's my constant and persistent um, optimism in the face of uh, what in, in the immediate sense, particularly uh, in places like Turkey or Bozici at this time, uh, are, are terribly alarming and, and, uh, and frightening uh, and, um, and serious. So, you know, it's kind of like uh, pessimism uh, on one level of the real, but a kind of optimism of the will. Um, uh, so uh, with that, it's the end of my, my I suppose you call it a lecture. Uh, and uh, so now I'm very eager to have you uh, share with me your feelings. Thank you.